in onze serie We Are One To Be. Waarin we filosofen, wetenschappers uit allerlei richtingen aan het woord laten. Vanavond Carl Prebam. Hij is neuroscientist en bekend vanwege zijn ideeën rond de holographic mind. We vonden hem op het Art Meet Science conferentie in Kopenhagen en spraken met hem over een hele lekkere lunch aan de haven. Eerst een klein stukje over wat hij zei op het Art Meet Science congres. It's loud enough, but you speak yeah, I'm loud. Loudspeaker now. <laughs> now we've got an interest. Um, I just want to make a few definitions here. Uh, with response, uh, responsibility, Fritz Perls made a very good comment. To take, a, to take the stance of being responsible is not enough. The word uh, responsibility can be thought of in terms of response-ability. In other words, just to say that we need to be responsible doesn't help enough. So we'll be responsible, but how? And one of the things that uh, we need to uh, develop is, in a sense of responsibility, is the ability to respond. In other words, to teach people in the first six years of life, if not a little later, actually, uh, frontal lobe's still developing around uh, 17 to 21. So uh, this whole idea of how to do something responsible is very important. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the mandala is a uh, representation of a holographic. Uh, uh, a holo I don't hear you. Mandalas are holographic in nature. That's what a holographic representation is. You do Fourier transform on this image that I have of all of you and you have of us, and you do the Fourier transform, which gets you into the hologram. What you get is a mandala. So the idea that everything comes out of a mandala is that basically you have this holographic representation as a potential in the universe, and then uh, all things grow out of it. So I'm very much intrigued with uh, uh, what we just heard. Now, uh, with regard to the economics, uh, I had just one or two things also. Um, you t I, I had a paper back in 1955 on utility theory and what parts of the brain are involved. And they do give you equilibrium notions and efficiency. Uh, frontal lobe part of the brain deals with getting this effectiveness that I was talking about. Uh, and I think the new economics, therefore, are much more frontal lobe in their what, what? frontal lobe, part of the brain, up mm. here, in the front, yeah. uh, have something to do uh, with the way our culture is finally developing. Uh, and it is, in fact, uh, a very late development in biology as well. Um, the final point is that uh, do not take chaos theory as it is quite uh, as being the uh, panacea for everything as uh, fashion would now have it. If you do not have constraints on turbulence, then you get these so-called bifurcation and everything goes wild, and pretty soon you do indeed have chaos. So chaos uh, theory, what it needs in order to operate efficiently and compassionately needs to have constraints on it or else the thong will just fly apart. So we need to address that. You can't just go into uh, nonlinear dynamics and think it's going to solve all the problems in the world. Well, you could hear it. Carl Prebum has strong ideas about many things, chaos, economy, holographic ideas, but we thought it was maybe better to talk with him over lunch and ask him some direct questions. We did this at Nijhaven in Copenhagen. Carl Pribom is neuroscientist. Iemand die onderzoekt naar de fysieke kwaliteit van de hersenen.
dat doe je niet alleen door operaties en snijden en dat soort dingen, maar ook met uh, elektrische pulsen en magnetische pulsen. Hij is erg beïnvloed door Michael Talbot, met zijn idee over de holographic mind, en door de chaostheorie van Prigogine, de Nobelprijswinnaar, waar hij ook heel veel contact mee heeft gehad. The mind remains uncharted territory. But some people do research it. And we talk with Carl Prebum, one of the main researchers, scientists on the mind. His thinking centers around the holographic idea, that the one is in all and the all is in one. And also with co-interviewing is... Anders Laukesen. Uh, I'm the editor of a little newspaper called the Christian Daily, where we... Uh, in, in Sweden. In Denmark. We are in yeah. Denmark now. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, so, so really, the first thing that I would I would like ask you to do is to give a very brief introduction to the universe that uh, that you have been using your your life to to uh, experience and to to unfold. Well, I'm a, a brain scientist, and uh, all of my ideas have come from uh, studying the brain and. What we've been led to, I'm interested in those aspects of brain science that deal with psychology, our experience and uh, our behavior. So that's what, uh, where my ideas come from, come from the laboratory and that mm. kind of thing. And, and this has been, been a, a field mixing psychology and you could say chemistry. Like, well, not so much chemistry as the electrophysiology. Mm. The, physics of the brain rather than the chemistry and what 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 are the sorts of, of uh, findings you have uh, uh, reached uh, I'm sorry I don't the findings come from applying the techniques mm. that are available mm. but uh, then the ideas that come have to be garnered from whatever is available to try to explain what we see in the laboratory What is the most curious thing about about the mind? Well, I, I uh, since I'm a brain scientist, I can't answer that uh, curious thing that we have mental events going on at all, or conscious mental events. But uh, with regard to the brain, some very curious things: have the problem of uh, the distributed order, which gave rise to the holographic idea, uh, the fact that we've just uh, sort of discovered is that uh, brain events, electrical events change uh, three, four hundred times per second. Things of that kind are very, very different from the way we thought about the brain, let's say, 30, 40 years ago. Well, one, of the, um, one of the main topics, I suppose, for the last uh, 20 years has been the question of consciousness. <clears throat> What is consciousness? Um, how does that relate to your to your area? Very much so. I've been writing about it at least for the last 30 years. And uh, we can have a sip of yeah. beer while we're uh, in the process here. So tiny. Oh, thank you. At a, a nice harbor place in Copenhagen, yeah? Well, this is called Night... Night... Newhaven. The New Haber. New Haber, yeah. New Haber. Oh. It looks rather old, in fact. <laughs> oh, but it is new. These houses, I have pictures taken 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, maybe even, of this part because it's such a gorgeous mm -hmm. view. the question I mean I'm trying oh, to, what I'm trying real now is to, to, to find out what is what is conscious what what, what is the most yes. important thing that we can talk about the, because uh, our experience I think uh, there was a period in psychology which is called classical or radical behaviorism mm. in which people essentially looked at behavior in a scientific fashion we could measure it we could manipulate it we could work with it And uh, I came. I was a brain surgeon to start with, and we be, I became aware of some patients who uh, whose experience didn't fit their behavior. They would eat a lot, but uh, they were not hungry. 
they would uh, be blind, it's called blind sight, they would not see anything over here, but if you asked them to point to something just by guessing, they could do it. So the personal experience and the behavior were different from each other. And so in a book that uh, George Miller and I uh, wrote, Jean Galanter, uh, back in 1960, started a revolution in, in uh, psychology called the Cognitive Revolution uh, because we called ourselves subjective behaviorists. That is, that uh, indeed things go on inside of our heads uh, that uh, we consider uh, that we can be aware of uh, and they do not necessarily get expressed in behavior and there are things in behavior uh, that we cannot are not consciously aware of of course Freud said that mm, part yeah, already yeah. so um, and I have done a book on Freud too and uh, mm. so uh, so that was uh, the first uh, uh, big shall we say change in, in my own uh, interpretation of how brain affects our experience. Uh, the second part then came when we, uh, in, in the way in which we do this, then we had to have a way of understanding how the brain works uh, in encoding experience. And that turned out to be a distributed process. And memory storage is distributed. And when the hologram became available as a metaphor uh, in the early 1960s, it became obvious that it would be a very good metaphor that could be followed through uh, on. And uh, that's what everybody's grabbed onto. But uh, I'm also a systems neurophysiologist and have done much more laboratory work on that end, actually, than on the holographic end. But as far as the hologram is concerned, that does encode our experience in such a way that uh, uh, it is distributed. So we have to, uh, the memory store is distributed or dismembered, and then we have to remember it. And that's what. Uh, Maybe you could repeat all. what the essence is of the holographic thinking. Sure. In, in the sense that it's a technique or it's a, it's a way of putting more dimensions into less dimensions no. by retaining the... No, the essence uh, of holography, uh, first of all, it was a mathematical invention. By Dennis Gabo. By Dennis Gabo. And um, the invention says that uh, essentially it has to do with the way a rainbow works. You can uh, diffract, you can uh, change something by putting it through a diffraction screen and you come up with wavelengths for light for instance or for sound and that's a sort of harmonic analysis and the essence of the hologram is that you store uh, the crossings of the interference patterns the nodes of interference between the um, pattern and that was a technique worked out by Fourier back in the year 1800 or thereabouts. And it's a very good technique for analyzing any pattern. And uh, the hologram itself is a potential. It's a way of ha storing something in the brain. It's a way that probably the universe also has one sort of storage aspect to it. Uh, which, when you then do the inverse transform, gets you back into space and time. So the Fourier uh, way of looking at things is simply a transformation into this enfolded order where everything is everywhere. Leibniz called it a monad back in the uh, 17th century. Uh, in simple terms, it means that if you have a hologram and you take a little piece of it, it contains the whole image. That's correct. Not to the same level that of detail, maybe, but it contains it the whole image. It depends. You have to think of it sort of like a zoom lens. If I zoom a lens out uh, and take a telephoto picture, uh, I get very good detail, but very poor depth of field. When I use it as a, a wide-angle lens, then I get very good 
depth of field but loss of uh, uh, detail and that is just a way a hologram. A small piece of hologram gets you better depth of field but loss of resolution. A, a large hologram gives you poor depth of field and large. And you come, came to the conclusion, partly based on your work as a neurosurgeon, that the brain works in a similar way. That In, in s- some respects, yes. That in some respects, some parts of the brain contain the whole. And in fact, if somebody loses the ability that is normally, say, for his right hand, that on a later part it might revive again, and that his memory, most notably, is stored in all kinds of parts in the brain. And even if a person loses half his brain, he still might have his memories. That's right, and so you've got to, I mean, that, those are the facts. And uh, then we have a mathematical description of this and a lot of data that we've gathered in the laboratory that support this kind of a description. But from there on, the world started to realize that this, this, this image of a holograph is not only nice to see little pictures, or, but in fact is something that goes for the whole world. And that many, yes. many phenomena that well, we see are, are... We owe this really to David Bohm, uh, who uh, called it the implicate order in physics. And he suggested that, uh, in fact, if we look at the universe without lenses, what we see is a hologram. So that there is an order in the universe. That doesn't mean that there are not stars there and all of that. But that there is a background, as it were, of an order in the universe out of which then uh, matter and discrete time, space kinds of things develop. So that was his idea. But that notion has been around for a very long time and in the old days people spoke about ether. These days people like Rupert Sheldrake sometimes talk about morphogenetic fields and for me it seems all a little bit of the same idea that there's something that pervades everything well, they're, they're somewhat different. Uh, with regard to the ether, the first time I heard David Bohm, I went to a class that he was teaching. At the end of the class, I went up to him and I said, you know, all the problems you raise really could be solved if you just reinvent the ether. Uh, I, I was which, which is the, the substance that the Greeks spoke about as, it's in everywhere, you can touch it, but it's there. Exactly. And uh, uh, I sometimes finish my... Uh, uh, talks by saying, well, you know, uh, if there is such a thing as a holographic uh, background to things, and the Upanishads and the Veda uh, already had all of that in there, uh, but they got it from us. Through We did all the hard work, uh, and they just stole it from us, and <laughs> they just plagiarized it. <laughs> I think the lady wants to come yeah. with our food. Okay, you want okay. to Yes, in fact, is this a good way to go? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm a physicist myself. So. No, that's a oh, you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's you're, sorry, fine. You are. I'm a so physicist. You understand. Yeah. I see. Yeah. The physicists yeah. always understand what About what things about. are, Hamiltonians and shit like that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should get into that because the hologram is only one aspect of things. And I think yeah, we yeah, should yeah. get into... Yeah, the entropy uh, thing, maybe. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. The problem is often that, that you sometimes you sense that a person is very interesting and has got something on the heart, but of course, as a Let me know, eh? it's not possible to know everything about everything. So, so it's a big, big help for me. That, uh, well, yeah, in a way that is. But you see, as a journalist, what you have to learn is that you, your task is to seek, inf- to welcome information. Not to seek it, but to welcome it. And as you do now, it's what a real journalist should do. You have brought together someone who might know a little bit more about these things and a person who knows a lot about these yeah. things. And so you, in fact, have created what you need. A good, a good, a good situation. And that is what you see more and more if you are open to it, that the world is really, a, you know, it gives you what you need. Isn't that that's a fascinating thing? If you have some kind of a center, the world somehow plays into it from time to time. You just have to be patient. Yeah, and to be there and, and kind of... Mm-hmm. But, it, but, it, but it's interesting how, how in a way, the, the interplay between thoughts and, let us call it, intuition or feeling of, of, of patient, I mean, how this is, because as a... As I think anybody working in in, 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 a, in a field that has to do with writing or whatever, 
you know that if you're impatient and you want to force things, they don't come, but suddenly they arise, and not only from inside your own ideas, but also from from outside. It's like you, you have a have a, a kind of attraction or or no, no, you or, seek or, out. or 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 or, or, or send out something I don't into know. the world. It's and how exactly it works, we, we can only speculate, but it works. And every journalist can tell you that, mm. and every scientist can tell you that. That suddenly they sit in a bath and they say Eureka, yeah, mm -hmm. because it comes to them. It's, mm. They have told the universe in, in by way of thinking about it or expressing mm. themselves, whatever, opening up that this is what they need, and then it comes. Mm. Yeah. Which makes the whole thing like an information society, in fact, so ridiculous because there's a lot of data in the world, mm. you realize, you know, when we talk about the information highway, we only talk about the data highway. Right. And information is what changes us. And information mm. is what you invite. Yeah. So inv in information comes from you, goes mm. into the world, and then it comes back. Mm. It's a process between you and the world. Mm. Between you as a, you know, a small mm. part and the world as a whole part. Mm. It kind of helps you. Mm. Why? How? I don't know. Yeah. But it works. I hope you're getting all of this wisdom from your father that on, mm. on tape. <laughs> yeah. We've traveled a lot together all, all to the world and place. I remember going to Findhorn one time and we drove back to England. And you were about 17. You were, you, you were not allowed to drive, actually, so you, she did drive the car. Mm. Yes. And um, I asked her, are you tired? No, what did, what did you really pick up? I think we did mushrooms at, uh, at uh, Rudolph's Landing first time together. And then on the way back... She said, Dad, can you stop? I know all this stuff. Yes, I believe in what you... But I've heard it so many times. It's okay. <laughs> all this stuff about the witches and the magic and the wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I know. So maybe you kids pick it up. <laughs> but it's very funny to see how this story about the holographic universe and the... I, I kind of gains momentum and as I say reading your, your stuff today I, I realized that talking about holographic media in fact a medium which is according to Marshall McLuhan like an extension of, of man's uh, senses yeah. Yeah, externalization of senses they become holographic mm. you realize if you listen to a little CD ROM or a CD mm. whatever mm. audio and what you get there is not only the music, you get the whole thing of technology, of the coding, the PCM coding of the disc, the, 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 the you know, a, a world of, of mathematics going into coding that stuff on it. You don't hear it, but in a way you're influenced by it. By that you're related to all these economic factors that, 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 that have made the CD. From the plastic to the uh, true, artist. But then, then I mean, taking the example of the CD, I'm, I'm a great, uh, I'm very, very fond of music, and I really love to listen to music. And I, I think that you can hear when you break things into digital uh, uh, bits. You can that, hear that, the that difference. You can hear the difference. I mean, it's difficult to to explain what it is, but even though you have very, very good hi-fi equipment, you can hear the difference. And 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 that is then another thing about this whole communication technology that do we I mean we get some of it yeah but digitalization but nothing, nothing can uh, can um, replace the meeting or the uh, no, well a technical person would say yeah well well you haven't digitized it to a high enough rate your frequency of digitization is not enough mm. I don't know whether it's that true, no? uh, but I mean this is just an example of of the problem in, 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 in any kind of communication that that, that it loses it always loses, always loses, loses something loses. but it gets pretty good as if you go to a concert and you're really at the mercy of the concert hall also mm -hmm. so some concert halls are very good and others are not yeah that's true um, what? Of course, yeah, that's true. Yeah, how do you do that? How do you do that?
Epstein. But even at the concert, you might uh, see a person or sense a person or whatever. I mean, all those things that, that uh, in a way, creates community or, or, or I mean, communication, community has to do with, with this. Uh, yeah, but, but isn't that, <laughs> come on, even, even technology can explain that. We can measure the electric field all around a person. I'm sure you can do that, yes? Mm -hmm. Up to a certain distance. So all the stories about auras and, you know, whatever you called it in the old days, yeah. are true. There's a certain thing there. Now, it's very logical that if you're in the vicinity of other people, that there is an interaction. Mm -hmm. You know, two fields, they interact. Mm -hmm. So if you're with a, with a bunch of people at a concert, there's a different energetic field. Now, our equipment might not be good enough to really differentiate what what's happening and so on but it's very logical that there is a thing happening and while you sit at home you don't have that until we find again a technology that you set on the on the table here and say oh come on this is the aura of whatever this politician or that person mm. or Jesus Christ things mm. and maybe that's what happened in the Middle Ages that people were since there was less distortion less pollution by radio waves that maybe when they thought about parts of Jesus Christ and stuff which they put in a church maybe they did feel the radiation some of it might, might have been bogus but there must have been some truth to it yeah well there is a lot of self-hypnosis and so on that goes on there may be a kernel of that sort of thing happening and then it gets to be a mass hysteria kind of thing, and, uh, and that can be very effective. I mean, people can be cured of their ills. Mm. Mm -hmm. But don't you think it's true? One of the things that, um, I was in Italy, at a place where they believe they can do time travel. It's mm -hmm. called Damanhur. Very interesting with selfic, what do they call selfic technology. Yeah, uh, um, yeah old stuff. But also uh, coils from Tesla. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Weird stuff. Anyway, I was there in a, in a space that was totally gilded with gold on yeah. all sides, and I had such a weird experience, as if my persona came back from the walls. Very. Much. So I came to the idea that a crown, a golden crown, has some function. And that's a question I ask to you. Suppose we find a crown. Should I keep this? Or no. You can be fresh. Thank you. Yeah. Suppose we find a crown. Now, it might be the crown of England that has maybe even more special capabilities, but let's make a golden thing. Putting it over someone's head, do you think it would influence the brainscape, the EEG, the electromagnetic field? Well, now, I think we have to uh, take things in, in scale. I think that whatever is going on there, compared to what the social situation is, that endows a king with the idea that he's all powerful or that he's a monarch. I think those, that kind of memory is much more powerful than any uh, electrical or magnetic field that would be produced. After all, our heart is uh, producing a tremendous field all the time and uh, there are some people I know who are studying this very carefully, but uh, each of these things has a role to play, but it's, it's not as big as you would say that kings are kings because of the gold in their no, no, crown. No, no. I'm you just know, interested to see if there's no way of technology... There's no way of finding out. Well, we can put a crown on someone's head and see what the brainwaves have changed. But that's because maybe they think differently. Ah, yeah, but I'm sure science has ways to, to trick people into having a crown without knowing. <laughs> well, all right, if, if that's what you're, you know, if I put a crown on your head and you don't feel well, crowned, yeah, crown. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, that would be a way of finding out. But, of course, uh, Anything that changes the field in the brain will also change the electrical field you're recording from. So you've got some problems in the actual technology there. But, it's an but to get sold, isn't it? Well, to get back to things that we can do now, and that is uh, conscious 
experience, and I don't like to use the word consciousness because mm -hmm. that's defined in so many different ways, but uh, our personal conscious experience by uh, using hypnosis and finding out how people uh, respond who are highly hypnotizable people versus low hypnotizable people, we can show that when they do not experience what other what they experienced before as pain, and now their hypnotizer don't experience as pain, uh, we can show the changes in the brain that go on as a function of that. So, you know, there are things that we can do. Uh, we have just uh, shown some things on uh, learning disabled uh, people who have some difficulty with learning disabilities and uh, uh, what the difference is in their brain waves. And Would that have, have a kind of social implications? Oh, you yeah. can say if we, if we are in a way taught that this is good, our brain reacts in, in, in a certain way, but we might also be taught differently. I tried. And the people working with the heart problem say that if you get your heart tuned up so that the variance in the heart is minimized and that influences the brain waves to become more relaxed and more in tune and so on. So when you're in a loving situation, when you feel wonderful, loving toward other people, then uh, everything gets synchronized and very... Whereas <coughs> if you feel hostile and aggressive, then everything goes out of sync and, and you can see that. So there are lots of good things that we can do and which we could not do a decade ago with the uh, technology having... I mean, the, what I can do now... I left Stanford in 1989 and I had eight electrodes and uh, beginning of PCs and so on and I had a PD P11 I had got up to uh, 34k of memory I now <laughs> I now record every day and every experiment one gigabyte of data I mean you know the the, the, the change has been so dramatic even in less than and if I go back uh, at the beginning of my career when I was doing monkey studies if we if two or three of us could study monkeys for about four or five years and study eight monkeys, we were 12 monkeys, we were lucky. Uh, toward the end of my time at Stanford, I was testing 100 monkeys a day. Mm. Everything can be, I've, I've been computerized since 1958, so... <laughs> but does this mean that, uh, let's take something like transcendental meditation. The yeah. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi always claimed that, indeed, if people became... Um, more quiet, followed his way of meditation, which was a, a very classic meditation with the mantra, then they would feel better, and because of that, the world would change. Right. Now, whether the world will, change, world will change is another thing, but you think that your technology now could prove that indeed their brain function kind of got better? Well, uh, I don't know what better means in these terms, but... Uh, what the Maharishi, uh, I, I have visited his place in, in Switzerland, he flew me there actually, and uh, uh, we got along very well, and I wanted to do a meditation study, but his people objected, so I've been doing hypnosis, but I've been wanting to do some hip, uh, meditation work too, uh, but their own people showed that uh, the frontal lobe theta rhythms become more coherent across the hemispheres. So at least we know some changes. Now, when you say better or worse, then you have to have some criterion of what you mean. And of course that, uh, we don't, I mean, that gets into another area of that. Of course, because if you are being threat threatened in a war or whatever, a very calm, Relaxed state of mind might not help you get out exactly, of the situation. So exactly. What is, what is good or worse? Well, it might too if you've got a trench to stay in. You'll stay in the trench <laughs> instead of getting out. But uh, you know, there. Uh, yeah, there so, though so these value uh, things have to be handled in a very situational uh, way. That each situation produces what we call good or bad. I, I call this a structural pragmatism that 
We, yeah. Yeah. In fact, the technology you were working on 10 years ago is now out on the streets because everybody can buy a PC with enough processing power. He buys a card with um, uh, electrodes and can measure his brain. And in fact, there's many machines out on the market, right. even for the amateur, to, to do what people would call biofeedback or brain sure. training. Or oh, yes. What do you think and about that? Well, fine. I mean, the more the merrier. I mean, uh, <laughs> all of that is, is great. I think there's a difference between uh, having fun with these things and playing with them and uh, doing serious science. I mean, you have to sort of separate, but uh, the way a serious scientist starts is always having fun. And the problem then is, you know, how, how much uh, effort and... Uh, how much support can you get to track it down until you can be so sure that everybody shares this mm -hmm. that you can share it with other people whatever you find and that's yeah, there's of course also the danger suppose that people get the notion that being more calm and relaxed is a be one way to fight say cancer or whatever the e disease and you know things like brain machines you, you know them have at times well they haven't actually claimed that but it was you know there was the feeling you're more relaxed and so you're better so this works as a preventive or even a curative thing against all kinds of diseases now that's a danger or, or how do you see well that? uh the danger is not in the technology the danger is in the people who use it and uh certainly we're all hopeful that there will be psychological ways of preventing cancer uh, as well as physiological ways of doing it. Um, I was trained as a surgeon. I was always told the aim of surgery is to eliminate it uh, so we don't have to do it anymore. And uh, that's certainly true. And uh, it, I wouldn't be surprised if in due time we will be able to at least yeah, well there are a number of technologies know, around right, that we, we will not have as many cancers that doesn't mean it's a cure-all but uh, in certain I think in, in many respects we very often bring on our own diseases such as the obvious one smoking brings on a tremendous number of diseases uh, and uh, in the states we're very aware of that are you a wasp or a bee? Yeah, I thought about this morning having a, a wasp in my ear. You did? Yes. Oh. It's a wasp day. Did he sting you? Yeah, oh no! no. Oh, but I, I would, I would He's in your, yeah, oh, getting in your pocket now. Smell that I was a good. Uh, that's right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Three away because maybe yeah. that's. Thank you. I, I, I would like to, um, to, to, to continue in the sense that I mean I understand this, uh, the value of. of knowing more about the brain and so on but if you relate this to the area of spirituality yes I mean um, in 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 the, the religious traditions you have occurrences in prayer or in meditation or in rituals that are different from ordinary perception now would you your your research uh, in a way um, uh, reduce that to uh, you could say an occurrence of the mind uh, or, 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 or can we bring in the notion of spirit here? Okay, uh, it's very interesting how you put that because when you said mind you pointed to your head mm. and then spirit you went <laughs> like this, you know, <laughs> out in the... Uh, uh, I have a definition that uh, mental events are emergent properties of brain events and that those aspects of mind uh, of mental processes that uh, we as humans especially want to engage larger uh, more encompassing uh, uh, realities uh, let's say uh, social realities or uh, could be uh, uh, science uh, could be religion uh, there are various ways that we like to get in touch with something beyond ourselves uh, that's called spiritual now I don't like the term mind I prefer to have mental processes I don't like the term spirit I like it spiritual processes because you reify uh, you 
make concrete something that isn't. Gravity is bad enough. Mm. Gravity is always a relation, and people start looking for gravitons. It's, I guess I'm still to get something to eat. You all cut. You didn't have two courses. No, no, oh. we. we we, uh, you can I'm, share I'm, mine. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Well, this food is so good that I mean, I, I I'm just gonna have some and then start. I'll, I'll, I'll have problems I'll with my wife way, if huh? I take two courses. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh -huh. Well, this what I had the herring uh, is something we have a hard time getting really good. Uh, it's uh, so wonderful. Yeah. So, so, so you prefer the process? Pros yes, it's a, the, these are processes. These are relationships. Mm. Oh, there it is. Thank you. But, but, but what I have, what I have, I have seen during these two days is that that obviously you have a, uh, a great respect for Buddhism. Yes. And and and, uh, um, I mean, Tibetan Buddhism especially is. Yes. I suppose. Sorry. Very much a, a, a system that. That brings out things in your mental processes that are very unusual and 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 and, and, and hard to understand. I, I I do think that the, the Buddhists say that they bring about processes that are truly natural, yeah, yeah. and they take away the perturbations, the the hanging on to the self, to the ego. So what they say, it brings you back to the natural state, isn't that? The mm -hmm. But how does this relate to 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 the function of the brain? I know this is a well. Without being a reductionist, uh, no. Levi Strauss said, and I've said this at the conference, that Levi Strauss said that uh, fairly simple things can be maybe reduced down to their elements, but that anything that gets slightly complicated. You have to deal with relations. That's what structuralism is all about. You can't understand language, you can't understand anthropology by trying to reduce it. What you have is different levels, different scales of investigation and different scales of existence. And um, you, um, you study the relationship within scale and between scales. Mm. And that's called structuralism. Mm. And in a way, it's the antithesis of postmodernism, but mm. not completely. So, um, I uh, I want to know how the brain operates when somebody is in a trance state, or mm. when somebody is in a meditation state, state or when yeah. the Sufis. Uh, do their whirling dervishes, you can't do it then, but when they get into the state, uh, when they put knives through their, yeah. you know, these are things that we can now begin to look at, and we have the techniques, and we should do that. And uh, I've invited some Sufis to uh, see if they'll ever get to my lab, and uh, the things are not yet portable with what we can do, we have 128 electrodes, and, well, and the computers are still fairly big. And but aren't you afraid that at, that at the time that you're going to measure these people and say, oh yes, this, uh, this special trans state uh, can be seen as these and these and these elec electric impulses in the mind, and then no. someone else will find how the to... The electrical impulses are never in the mind. The mind is a Mind is a an inference from behavior, whether it be verbal behavior or whatever. Okay, now well, let's say that you uh, can measure it on the skull or wherever in, mm -hmm. in the brain. Then someone else say, "Oh yeah, but this is due to receptor B uh, reacting that and that." And then scientist number seven will uh, invent a little pill that brings you to that state. And then Marvin Minsky is going to say, "Hey, the meat computer did it again." Yeah, <laughs> there are those who'll try to do that. I don't think that. Uh, it's going to <coughs> be that successful uh, because uh, I think it, it, it confounds scale. I mean, what's happening in the brain, what's happening electrically in the brain, what's happening chemically in the brain is at a different scale from what happens uh, in, as, an experience. Uh, as an experience. 
Yeah, but still people take uh, things like uh, well, hope ecstasy relate. or whatever and they have experiences that they say are uh, similar to, to Zen meditation. I will, you know, I'll, I'll attest to that, that it, it gives me similar unity experiences sometimes. Yeah, and hopefully you'll have it during orgasm, you know, and uh, when you're... Yeah. You know, so, I mean... We had a conference two years ago, same set of conferences that I'm at here, yeah. um, which called Scale and Conscious Experience. And we had quantum physicists all the way up to behaviorists, and everybody contributed. And I don't think you can understand these things without knowing what's going on at each scale. But you don't reduce it down. Yes, maybe somebody will get a pill that will make you feel in a particular way and maybe people get addicted and then we have an addiction problem. Uh, I'd much prefer to do it without the pill. I mean, but this then becomes the society has to decide how it's going to manage. Yeah, but the practical uh, problem is that, uh, you know, I did meditation and stuff and I got to some kind of experience there that I saw as a divine, inspired grace, whatever. Now kids go do disco they take an ecstasy pill, their brain uh, demonstrable so gets into a certain state that, that even the scientists now can, can trace down in, in, in the work you do. Uh, and they think, oh, well, this is just another technology. And they, they, don't, they don't make the connection to the wider, the wider reality. There are dangers in everything, but uh, when Huxley and I were on a television program together, I compared the drug scene to automobiles. I mean, you can take that truck that just went by, the guy could run right through here and kill us all, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. And I think we have to learn to live with drug effects and manage them the way we do automobiles and all other dangerous vehicles and there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, learn how to do that uh, the, and as you just said if we were educated properly we would see the difference between taking a pill and getting a kick out of it temporary kick and getting in relationship with uh, the more spiritual aspects of nature mm -hmm. and uh, there's a big difference and with proper education people can get it. So, so, so does this mean if I understand you, you, you correctly that for instance um, <clears throat> when when you have the, this pill Fontex uh, yes. yeah, yeah. That, um, according to what I've heard, can seem to help people with with, with certain mental problems to to get in in a more durable state. Of, uh, of uh, that that this is a as, a short as good a, a good a good as a good solution as let us say going through long uh, yes. psychoanalysis that might then chemically change your, your, your things or, oh, or is it a shortcut that... Uh, oh, I think yeah. that's fine. I mean, if you want to use drugs briefly to induce certain states that make you more susceptible mm. to psychotherapy, for instance, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It does shortcut cut things much. You, know, yeah. you don't have to spend seven years. The, the danger is comes only when you begin to be addicted to the drug and substitute the drug for real life. Thanks. That was Carl Priba.